He's John Timpane. And he's Don Rooney. And this is The Musical Intertube. Now you may ask, why is this podcast called The Musical Intertube? And we may reply, because that's its name, of course. Now, how did this podcast get that name? Back in college, we hosted a radio show. Once, we tried to introduce a soothing musical interlude. Instead, we messed up and wound up introducing a soothing musical intertube. And the name stuck. So here we are, hundreds of years later, still talking. Talking to interesting people about their interesting lives. Difference makers who really make a difference. Our guest on today's musical inner tube is none other than Justin Tim Payne. He may be my nephew, of whom I am very proud, but he's also a true talent powerhouse. Actor, director, filmmaker, writer, producer, musician, podcaster. He started doing ninja movies a few years ago, made a bunch of those, and recently has expanded his portfolio as a filmmaker making really original, interesting films that include two films in the in the year 2020 when no one could go out and talk to anybody, The Distanced, which is a lovely film, I have to say, Justin, and Christmas Cancellation, which we will talk about in detail later. His latest is a short horror mystery thing titled The Strangle of Ivy. But because he isn't busy enough, he's made a large number of albums, too, playing all the instruments, doing a lot of the voices, and the latest one, I think, titled Hers, is a true triumph. He's also an expert podcaster in the Star Trek and Star Wars adjacent universes, with the podcast called Trek Off even become the subject of one of his films, Trek Off the Motion Picture. Welcome, Justin Tim Payne, man. Hi. Okay, do I, should I just call you John or go Uncle Johnny? Or funny Uncle You can call, yeah, me, call, call me Uncle Johnny because that's what yeah, we knew each other at. Yes, yeah, so it's, it's for, for your listeners. Uh, his name used to include the name Funny in front of it. We all called him Funny Uncle Johnny uh, growing up. So now when you see him on the street or correspond with him, uh, I've laid down the copy. You must all now from this point forward refer to him as Funny Uncle Johnny, and he will hate me for it. Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to have to change the uh, header on the uh, on the website. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Justin. So one of the reasons we're having you on is you're not the only person like you. There's plenty of people who live the way that you live. Uh, they they pursue their arts. They uh, use uh, today's new tools in the media communications explosion. So I'd like to go ask you first of all that until recently. You were a nurse, is that correct? Yes. Um, I uh, So I started, I, I know I became a nurse right before my son was born, who just turned 17. So I did it for 15 years. And then about two years ago, I finally got to stop doing it. But I, um, we started way back uh, when I was working as a professional actor. And my wife was sort of rising in her field of human resources, where she is now like highly sought, or, sought after. Um and at the time, as we were just starting out, we knew that we wanted to have a family. We knew that, you know, there was not an opportunity to do that as a one income household, especially in the Washington, D.C. area. It's, 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 you know, very expensive. So, um, understanding that we would need to have two in- incomes and understanding that I still wanted to be able to have the schedule and freedom to do the artistic stuff, we, we settled on nursing. There was a, a man named Carl who I was acting in a movie with, um, struggling to make ends meet and, in walks Carl. He's a swing at sheer madness at a swing as someone who is in like every other weekend um, at the Kennedy Center doing a little independent films. And he drove a BMW. And I did not understand how this was possible. And he said, I'm, he said, I'm an OR nurse. And I was like, oh, wow, boys can be nurses. Um, and he goes, oh, yeah, certainly boys can be nurses. So I said, I think I'll go to nursing school. Now, when you go to nursing school and when you're a nurse, you always meet people who don't know quite what they want to do in their life. And they go, you're a nurse. I'll do that. There's probably been a, a hundred people who've come to me and told me, um, including your sister, um, who was like, maybe I'll go to nursing school. Um, yes, my uh, sister Shannon, sister- ladies and gentlemen, yes. who is now yeah. a very busy nurse. A very busy and and far beyond anywhere that even I got. She's she's a better nurse than ever I was. Um, That's what but, she says, yes. Um, yeah, she does, directly to my face, all the time, at three in the morning. Um, so I came back, it took the the director about three years to make the film came back and i said hey i have graduated nursing school and passed my boards i'm a nurse now and he was dumbfounded that i just kind of decided to do it um so i didn't go into it because i had any particular love of nursing i didn't dream of it my whole life i always felt terrible saying that um what i do love is is taking care of people 
And, and so I worked in critical care. And while I was never a giant lover of the profession, certainly being surrounded by people in need and having the opportunity to meet those needs in a way that was unique to me um, was something that I really did, really did come to value and enjoy doing. But uh, it came to about two years ago that, that my wife said, okay, I think I've gotten to the point where we can afford for you to just do art. And so I went in and I did my last day and I cried a little bit and sat down and started writing my next movie. She's a really nice lady. She's an incredibly nice lady. We've been married. For, we've been married for almost twenty-seven years now. Oh, well, there, there you go. Now, I, I was mentioning before we went on the air that in my days in radio, as radio vagabond, which a lot of us were, we were moving from city to city and market to market. Uh, there were a number of radio guys that I worked with whose wives were nurses because that was an equally a better paying but equally mobile uh, way to make a living. So I. I Totally understand that. Uh, the other thing I, I wanted to ask you, though, is that, again, one of the things that I did way, way back uh, was uh, when I was in college, I went to film school and um, I got a degree in uh, in communications, which included film and television. And all of the guys that were in film and television then were, were doing films that it seems you and the others who have gone beyond uh, film school are doing. And that is they would finance their own film with their credit cards. And it always had a lot of special effects. So it usually was a science fiction or a horror film. And I was wondering when you got your chance to make films, is that kind of where you went? Uh, yeah. I mean, I think that I, I would be remiss if I, if I didn't, you know, sort of call out some of the inspirations for this. Um, um, I like, you know, I, I, consider myself to be Duke of the nerds. And so like everybody, everybody who is in the nerd fiefdom um, pays homage to Kevin Smith uh, yes. because, because you, because you have to, um, he is one of, of two sets of filmmakers. You could also call out Richard, Link, Richard Linkletter for slacker. Um, you could call out, you know, if you want to go earlier, Sam Raimi for the first evil dead movie um, that he financed on his own. And then has now turned into an Academy Award fil filmmaker. Um, but Kevin Smith is where I jumped in, uh, like so many people like me. Uh, the, of course, he made Clerks for you know twenty nine thousand dollars on credit cards and a prayer, and ended up you know getting into Sundance, and then suddenly you know now he's Kevin Smith. Um, the other uh, the the other person I would be remiss if not calling out uh, that is really well known is uh, Daniel Myrick and Eduardo Sanchez, uh, who took seventeen thousand um, dollars right. 20 minutes from where, where I went to high school and made a little horror film of the woods called the Blair Witch Project. Um, and, and they turned that into a hundred million dollar, you know, giant franchise. Um, and here in Maryland, Ed is, is a benefactor and a hero to a lot of people, myself included. Um, if you are working on an independent film and you seek out Ed, Ed will converse with you. Ed will hang out with you. I've been to Ed's house. Um, Ed was, uh, was the executive producer on Ninjas versus Monsters and on some other films that I've been involved with. Um, uh, he really has paid it forward to other sort of B, B movie filmmakers who are trying to like elevate their work from this area. He has a real heart for that. So, um, so I came up right after this glut of people who, who paved the way for us. And in the case of Ed specifically, have been open to dragging us along with them um, uh, at no benefit to them. Ed, Ed, Ed doesn't need us, but we need him. So, so, so thanks for that. We, the, the last person is a person that people don't know. Um, and I feel needs to be called out is a gentleman who worked out of Baltimore in the seventies. whose name was Don Doler. Um, Don Doler. Uh, <laughs> nobody knows who he is unless you're deep in the film community. He, made a little film called The Alien Factor and another one called Night Beast in the 70s and when you couldn't really get those made. And uh, and because they were shot on film and he converted them to video, they actually, because nobody was really doing that, got national airtime on UHF stations and stuff like that. Um, uh, he would get whatever local talent would do it free. For instance, his his the score of his very first uh, um, film was written by a guy uh, who had never been heard of before, whose name was J.J. Abrams. Um, uh, he started a, a micro-budget filmmaking magazine uh, that everyone in the business knows. Um, 
but the general public doesn't know him. I was the star of and wrote the music for his last two films before unfortunately passed away with cancer. And, um, and he really was a just do it yourself in your backyard. If it looks like crap, that's okay. Um, do the best you can because the love of the love of it was, you know, being with his friends and making movies. So, so a lot of credit needs to be given to them, as you were saying, Don, um, to the people who came before. In the case of us, yeah, our first movie was called Ninjas vs. Zombies. Um, my friend, my friend Daniel Ross and I are both big horror fans. I'm a huge martial arts movie fan, but the, we could have made it anything. What we really did is we walked into a blockbuster video. Um, everybody over 40 knows what that is and, and looked around and tried to figure out the movie that wasn't there. That's just simply how we came up with the name of the movie. We saw martial arts movies. We saw horror movies. We didn't see a lot of martial arts horror movies. And so we said, how can we have, we know we can't have stars. We know we don't have a huge budget. How can we have a name that sells the film? So I wish I could say it was out of a deep love for ninja movies or zombie movies. It was just sort of a, how do we have a movie that even if it looks kind of cheesy, people go, oh, damn it, I got to see that. Um, and that's that's where that came from. What year are we talking about now? Uh, we're on the 15th anniversary. That would be 2008 um, when when we made the first one. Because you just you just described the beginning of what we might call more or less the the modern indie film movement where a lot of people got into making movies because it suddenly got to be a little easier than it used to be and that the the means of production the means of making movies were not only for a few people who had a lot of money or were part of the uh, studio system but just folks who want to make movies in their backyard it suddenly and slowly became easier to do that and i'm wondering if if you were aware of of being sort of at the, you know, the cresting wave of this. I was, I was lucky to really, I think if I had started in 2006, I would have been able to do it. And if I started in 2012, I, I, I would not be able to make a name for doing it. Um, so I was lucky to come when I did. I certainly, I, I agree that I'm part of the second wave of people doing that. The first wave being, you know, I mean, Blair and clerks came out within two years of each other. Um, so, so, Beyond that, the the big thing that happened, of course, was digital filmmaking and the and the advent of Adobe Premiere, um, where where suddenly you know, the the first movie that it, that Zombies was shot on tape, but it was digital tape. So you could take the digital tape it and and you could capture the digital image, but you weren't getting like the 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 video files after that. The sequel to that, Ninjas vs Vampires, which was two years later, that's the first one where you're sticking an SD card into your digital camera. And it's an H, it's an, it's an HD camera as opposed to a camera that still is like the old SD type. And you're just pulling the card out and copying files over to your computer. Everything totally 100% digital at that point. And, and it made it so where, you know, if you look at what, you know, what Kevin Smith had to do with, with clerks, which was shot on film, he still had to go to the old movie Ola and go and, and do the edits and then send it off and, 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 and edit it that way and cut some of it manually. And now suddenly I could do, you know, three tracks of video and eight tracks of audio and and color correction and everything on a PC that I could get for less than a thousand dollars at home on a camera that was less than two thousand dollars, and and just to get that level of image three years earlier would have been twenty thousand um, dollars. And now, you know, for filmmakers out there, and I'll talk later about about what's sort of gone wrong about it, but now you can get a camera for less than a thousand dollars at a computer for less than six or $700 and make stuff that would make what I made back then look infantile. Like you There can- are stories about people who are shooting movies on their iPhones. Oh, certainly. Yes, absolutely. I mean, there's, there's, and there are now attachments for your iPhone that allow you put, to put um, anamorphic lenses on top of the iPhone camera where you, you can put it on there and, and say, I want to shoot this in a 50 millimeter lens and you can, you can do it. And your iPhone camera has, you know, no, no amount of research has gone into cameras more than the cameras on iPhones and, and Google phones. That's where all of the research is going is how do you make them smaller and better and beautiful? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's crazy what you, what you can do now. I'm lucky that at the time, not a lot of people were doing it, but the tools were available. I think that the problem now is that everybody is doing it. So finding your, finding a way to be noticed at this point is probably the larger issue. So how did you raise 
Talk about raising money because I I love your story. Uh, talk about how you raised money at first. My impression from a couple of hundred miles away is that you were maxing out everybody's credit card, not just yours, and and not telling them. No, I'm only kidding. That you were maxing out credit cards and and just getting money in all these ways, which one was more or less used to hearing about. And then things changed, and then there was a little thing called Netflix that came along. Talk about that, you know, raising money and distribution of these films. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I used to joke that our first film was financed by by major banks, uh, Visa and MasterCard. Um, and they, you just did, you, you took the credit cards, you maxed it out, you took the tax return. We would always budget for for, okay, here's where the... Here's where, you know, my wife might be getting a bonus and the tax return is coming on this day. And and if we take that and we add that to, you know, just nine thousand dollars of credit card, well, that we can get up to like eighteen, nineteen thousand dollars by doing that. And then, you know, you buy whatever equipment that can get, you buy, borrow, steal. Keep in mind Facebook is is just at its infancy at this point. So you don't have community community the way you do now. There is no crowdfunding. Um you can try and go for traditional um, financing, uh, which can happen in a number of ways. There's a studio system, and then you can have sort of the the independent financier. Uh, we got offered independent financing on all of our films. Somebody came in and said, I will give you $50,000. And we go, yay, this sounds amazing. And immediately they go in, we've read the script, and we want this different. Your first shot is this. This is what we want you to do. And it's usually a guy who always wanted to make movies and now sees an opportunity to make movies with you doing the work. Um and it's often someone who doesn't know anything about filmmaking. Uh, so so uh, it gave us the freedom to do what we wanted, but we also had no clout. Um, we, nobody knew who we were. Nobody, none of us had done anything of note. Uh, the nice thing was that after the first one came out, uh, Ninjas vs. Zombies came out, it won some awards. It got a, a, a write-up in, in some magazines. Um, it got physical distribution in video stores. Uh, the... At the time, there were three major video stores, Blockbuster, Hollywood Video, and then there was one in the, uh, that is not on the coast called Family Video. That's It's all across the, the rest of the country. And we got just distri- physical distribution of Family Video and in England. Um, and so with that, we were able to, the second time around, uh, use half credit cards, but able to sort of raise a little bit of money from people who we told we would pay back with 10% interest. And, and they believed that we would do it. Um, because we were doing so well. Unfortunately, the first movie, um, uh, our distributor at the time, um, uh, took what was a, a hefty sum, uh, far more than the budget that we were owed, moved to Canada and, uh, told us that if we wanted to sue him for the money, we could certainly go to Canada and try. Um, and so that happened. This, that um, stuff happens so much in the movie industry. It's, yeah. You know. And, um, and, in, and in music too, you hear you know people taking the money and I, and running, and not so much now because there isn't any money. But uh, in the old but, days, yeah, yeah. Li- lit- literally the email was was I, I go what, you can't take our money. We're going to take you to court. And he goes, I would I would invite you to. Um, you can come to Canada and try and extract. Yeah. Um, the the fun thing is, yeah. To speak to your point though, we got to the third one, Ninjas versus Monsters, and we did we wanted to do it at a larger budget. We it, if you watch the three movies in succession. The third one is clearly another level. There's, there's, it looks like a professional movie, whereas the other two kind of have that shot in your backyard look. And we got a lot of that money through Kickstarter, um, which was just in its infancy. Not a lot of people were doing it. Um, for anyone wanting to raise money through Kickstarter, it is a full time job in which you have to make, you'll, if you have friends on Facebook, they will diminish by like 15%. Everybody gets tired of hearing you ask for it. You go to sleep every night just feeling like a beggar on the street. It is it is absolutely one of the most soul sucking. I don't know how people fundraise for a living because it is it it is not something that that I enjoyed doing at all. But we we were able to raise enough money to make a good enough movie to get it out. Uh, mostly because yes, Ninjas versus Vampires got onto Netflix um, for a couple of years, and I'd love to walk your listeners through how that works or how that worked for us and why. That sounds like a boon that maybe it not is. At the time, Netflix was not doing a lot of it, of its own programming. It was obtaining independently produced things uh, through a through a third party. Uh, in our case, I think it was Gravitas Features. Um, 
Gravitas would not buy directly from independent filmmakers because that put them in a legally dubious spot because they would want to do far more checking of 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 due diligence. So what they would do is they would buy from other um, smaller uh, smaller distribution companies so that they took on the legal risk. And the distribution company buys it from us. So Netflix Netflix plays in the case of Ninja Zero Vamp- Vampires for two years. They pay twenty thousand dollars to our to, to Gravitas. Gravitas paid fifteen thousand dollars to our person. And then the way the deal is structured is, and, and this is again, if I could rework the way deals are made for independent filmmakers, they you have to pay them back the expenses that they paid on your film. But they don't take it out of the gross. They take it out of your net. So they got $15,000. They are due 30% of that $15,000. So let's just say 33% for math, which leaves 10. Then they take the net. Then, then they take their cut of the, their expenses out of your 10. So they take an, they've taken their five. Now they've taken another six or $7,000. So I got $3,000 from the $20,000 Netflix deal. And of course, we couldn't pay people up front for a lot of what we did. So what we did is we had to split that up. So my take home from that Netflix deal was three hundred and twenty-five dollars. Hollywood math. It's so amazing yes. how this happens. So yes, because because you you have big pictures, huge pictures, and actors go back and say, "Hey, I want my cut," and they say, "No, no, this money, this uh, uh, film that made seven hundred million dollars at the box office, we actually didn't make any money on it." Oh and yeah, it's because of that creative bookkeeping that you're talking about. Look, looking at look, like you know, not to bring up Kevin Smith again, but if you look, they, he just came out with Clerks Three, which is a tough watch. Uh, make sure you're in a good place before you're watching it. It is desperately sad, but a wonderful film. Um, the it's the main, sad, it's oh, a it's, sad movie. It is, yeah, it's it's. I we went to go see it. We were expecting another kind of. I mean, it's raucous and funny and profane and all the things the Clerks movies are, but we were not ready for what the film does um yeah. uh and we were we were not su- expecting to be an audience full of people sobbing um no. so <laughs> so it's really it's very good but the main one of the two clerks jeff anderson um didn't want to come back because for clerks two uh they only spent seven million dollars making clerks two clerks two made like 60 million dollars and he was never paid a cent in residuals for clerks too, because the math said that the math said that it was still in the red, even though it was made for seven million. There was no advertising for clerks two outside of print, and it the total came down to fifty. But because of fancy math, he never got paid. So in order to sign for clerks three, they needed to rectify that. Um, but that yeah, that's Hollywood math for you. We'll return to our podcast in just a moment, but first, here's a soothing musical interlude. Justin Timpain is an artistic renaissance man, movie maker, actor, writer, musician, podcaster, and cultural influencer. Justin has produced, written, and directed movies such as Ninjas vs. Zombies of 2008, Ninjas vs. Vampires 2010, and Ninjas vs. Monsters 2012. He followed those up with Trek Off, the motion picture 2016, A Christmas Cancellation and the Distance, both 2020, and this year's The Strangle of Ivy. Justin is also a very accomplished songwriter and musician with albums that include Three of 2008, Unlove Sick, Love Songs 1991 to 2017, and a real masterpiece titled simply Hers of 2021. Check out the Facebook page for Justin's production company, Endlight Entertainment. It's at facebook.com slash endlightent. That's E-N-D-L-I-G-H-T-E-N-T. And now we return you to the musical inner tube already in progress. Your latest movies are really a step ahead and a step beyond. Uh, And I don't know which one I want to talk about more, but maybe let's talk a little bit about Christmas cancellations since Christmas is only a couple of months away. And... And everybody should go watch it on Amazon Prime. <laughs> oh, is it on Amazon Prime? Yes. And do you think if I wanted to watch your movie, I could go on Amazon Prime and find a Christmas cancellation? I think you could. And for every dollar you spend, I will likely get 15 cents. So, all right. Some more of that great math. Yeah. <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, 
far be it from us to make a plug for anybody, but it's a really good movie. And you should go see it. It's on, I believe, Amazon Prime, right, Justin? It, it is it, it is on Amazon Prime. Um, now, now, we don't want to give much away. And I know that you, because it's a movie that changes <laughs> and the meaning, you know, changes and gets super powered. How would you describe what happens in this movie? Because I, I thought it was quite clever and wonderful and actually in a, profound at the end of it. So, you know, what can we tell people to get them to watch the movie, but not give the boat away in a handbag? Um, a Christmas cancellation is the story of what happens when uh, five characters in a sitcom, pretty much like Friends, um, realize that they are fictional characters and don't really exist. And that they are fictional characters on a TV show that is bound for cancellation and what happens to them when the show goes off the air. And so it is a character that w- – it's a show that was written a lot about – my experience as a nurse and seeing people with cancer deciding whether or not they wanted to try to fight it or whether or not they wanted to live a comfortable life at the end. Um, and so the theme of themes of the movie kind of revolve around, do we try to fight the inevitable versus do we enjoy the life that we have while we can? Cause you will not win that fight against the inevitable. So that's sort of what the, the film is about. So a film that a, a concept, which by the way, at the time seemed really outlandish. I feel like every other movie I watch now has has this thing where where people get to meet the the creator of who they were and the the fictionality of who they are. I feel like it's it's become a theme since then. Um, which is why I think Hollywood wants to follow everything I do. <laughs> well, and it's it it does grapple with uh something that in philosophy is known as the simulation uh problem which is that we really are incapable of disproving the notion that the reality we live in is a simulation. We think it is reality. We think it is the only reality. Of course, it's our reality. But it is mathematically are, more likely that we are in a simulation than we are in actual reality. Right. And so much for math, right? Uh, and so, anyway, I'm wondering, can you talk about, uh, you know, just very briefly in a minute or two, the making of that movie, how it was different from your other films, because there's a different look, there's a different pace. It's a full length film, um, and and by the way, very funny. Yeah, well, I I mean that that's part of the brand. I always want to do. I ultimately I have friends who who like doing darker things, and I have a lot of dark themes in my films, but I I want them to be fun. <laughs> it's when it comes down to it, I feel like there's there's a lot of value in just laughing and having a good time. Um, the big difference in that film is that the entire film was shot in my house. Um, but, but, uh, um, the, the, the film takes place in a sitcom, which is in one location. Um, so by changing the lighting, changing the lensing, changing the way we shot it, the film takes place in four different realities on the same set. Um, which is, you know, pretty convenient when you want to be able to shoot in your own house. Um, uh, the production of it goes to, you know, I mentioned before the Facebook didn't exist at the time. One of the great things about this film um, is now that there are Facebook communities, the film took place over Christmas time. We knew we wanted to shoot it in one location. We're going to use our house, but we really wanted to make it seem unbelievably, overwhelmingly Christmassy. Um, and uh, because that's production value. But instead of having to spend the money on it, we were able to just go to a neighborhood Facebook group and go, "Who who's throwing away Christmas decorations? And by the, we filled a garage with, with just <laughs> donated, <laughs> donated stuff. And I think that, I think that for anything, if I wanted to make, I, I just served as, um, as first assistant director and producer on Strangled Ivy, which we talked about that was not a film that I wrote directed, but that I was, that I helped head up on the crew. And again, we had horror things we needed to get. And we were able to go on Facebook going, who has this? Does anybody have that? Um, and half of our stuff is just people who get excited that there are movies being made and go, yeah, I'd love if my garden tools were used in this. I'd love, like you were just kind of <laughs> able to go on and have people loan you things. Um, so those opportunities are, if you want to talk about a difference, the you're not just crowdsourcing funds anymore, but you're crowdsourcing crew, you're crowdsourcing materials, you're crowdsourcing things you couldn't do before. And I think that that, again, to opening up doors for future filmmakers, that is another avenue that I did not have open to me. 
which now would be so much easier for me to do some of the things I did because I could just go online and go, who's got this? And, you know, 15 people would go, I've got it. Um, so it was it was a joy to do in our house, a joy. Every member of my family shows up in it. Um, uh, unfortunately, um, we were not able to include uh, Johnny's music, which we did. Uh, There's a little car radio dog in Ninjas vs. Zombies. Um, uh, uh, but it's part it of was, the movie as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> but it was the first movie that we ever tried to make sort of artistically outside of blood and guts and jokes and swords. Like, how can we hit people in the heart? And it, it's the first movie that we did that ever started winning awards, which was nice. Um, because you, you get much different critical response to a movie about the nature of life than you do about how cool it would look like for a ninja to cut off, cut off a werewolf's head. So, uh, did you rate your house to yourself? Um, for n- no, no. Oh, okay. <laughs> no. Think about um, that next time you shoot in your house. You can rent your house to yourself. I, I've, I've heard that that happens. Unfortunately, when you use I can't your own aff- property. I can't afford me. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> that's, a, that's, that's what it ultimately comes down to. Now, then, you, when it comes to filmmaking, now there are new opportunities for financing. There are a lot more. I just did a couple of of films uh as assistant editor for a uh, for a company that is just sort of investing in the idea of creating higher budget low higher budget micro budget films so throwing a hundred th- the the market the idea is you throw a hundred thousand dollars at 15 films and maybe 14 of them don't do anything but if one of them just cracks 20 million dollars then it's been worth the investment um so so and I've seen a lot more of that existing as Giant studio films like Indiana Jones and The Flash, you know, come toppling down to the box office. You hear that they lose a hundred million, two hundred million dollars. You know, you you're finding companies who are willing to make the investments on what's going to be the next Conjuring, what's going to be the next Everything Everywhere All at Once. That 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 you can make for you know Everything Everywhere was what seven million and and it grows to like a hundred and ninety, like that's something like that. So that that is. A new paradigm that people are looking at, especially right now in the wake of the strikes. Let me let me ask you about the distribution part of it because you were talking about when you were ready to make the ninja films, uh, uh, you went to the to the blockbuster, to the video store, and looked and saw what was on the shelves, and that was always a reliable source. In fact, there was a whole industry there of direct to video, where people were making uh, films specifically to go in the video stores. And that, of course, died in the early 2000s when all of the video stores died. So now if you're making an independent film, how do you get it out there to the people? Is it all deals with the the Netflix and the Prime videos? Or, or how exactly, if you're making an independent film, how are you going to get it in front of eye, eyeballs out there? The streaming versions, yeah. I've been pretty old-fashioned about it still. Um, uh, all of my features, with the exception of Trek Off, um, we ended up selling to distributors the same way that you would back in the nineties. So you, you cold call some of them. We had a sales agent, uh, for three of them, and then we had uh, relationships with them. So we didn't need a sales agent anymore because we could just do the same deal with the same distributor as last time. Um, so I'm old fashioned in that, in that regard, but I think that that is starting to go away now. It's starting to be much more, like I said, uh, Micro studios funding things that they intend to to distribute. The I said earlier that I would come back to the topic of what has gone wrong. The problem is, it's so easy to make it look good now. It's so easy to make it look good now, especially with the advent of AI, which allows you to you can do AI coloring on your film, where you can take this. You know, we're all you you can't see, but we're all recording on webcams right now, and an AI can take it, make it 4K, make it look cinematic. And you can just do that with a single prompt and you don't need a crew to do it. Um, there is a, a, a program that was used primarily for video games called Unreal Engine. That is the way that you were able to play games like Doom and Tony Hawk and stuff where the world kind of moves in three dimensions. They've released a version of that um, for filmmakers, which then you could just use a controller and make your shot like you would want it on a controller and then render it out photorealistically so that you can create any environment that you want. And you've, I've started to see... You know, I watch a lot of big popcorn films and I've started to see Unreal Engine being listed in the credits of these films and they and they allow their software to be used for free. Um if so why is the why the, is this bad? It's it's good and it's bad. The 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 good part, of course, is that it's everything is open 
to everyone to do. Um, the problem is, is that now uh, there are so many people putting out so many films. And then you look to what has happened with the streaming model on TV, which is now Amazon and, and Hulu and Max and Disney and Netflix are all also scrambling to take take over the market of what you watch as an impulse buy, you know, flipping through on your TV. Go, I think I'll watch this. That what made something like Ninjas versus Vampires able to get a million views was that you flip through and you go, oh, there's Ninjas versus Vampires. Maybe I'll watch this. But now, because everybody's trying to grab that, how how does a, a Ninjas versus Vampires compete with the new Star Wars show on Disney? I I as a lover of pop culture, and that's my films all sort of fit into that genre, nerd you know nerd culture. I can't keep up with all the shows that I wish I could watch. You know, I love superhero shows. I haven't seen all of them. I love horror shows. I haven't seen all of them. I have a list of, of highly budgeted shows that I've been meaning to get to that I can't get to. When we started making it, Marvel was in its, in its infancy. Star Wars wasn't on TV. But now I don't know how as a, I don't know how you would even get noticed now that there's so much going on and you have... 10 times as many indie filmmakers putting stuff out and the studios are putting out for streaming 20 times what they used to. The odds of getting discovered in any reasonable way. There there are incredible films with with Academy Award winning stars. Look at Tar. Tar Tar was nominated for Academy Award. It is a wonderful but difficult film. And it tanked. It just, nobody saw it. It disappeared. It's out of the conversation. Nobody will ever watch Tar again. It just is gone out of the conversation because the news cycle has just forgotten and it goes forward. So it's hard. I mean, why would you watch a movie about road covering? It just seems like it, it, it just lies there. It's black. It steams a couple of minutes and, and it hardens. Yeah, but it's sticky. Okay. No, I saw Tar, by the way. It's a very good <laughs> movie. Glorious. Uh, I'm a musician, so it appeals to me. But I know that... It deserved a larger uh, look. You yeah, know, it and did. it's and it's not just that. I mean, it's it's you, you had movie after movie after movie this summer that you know Indiana Jones couldn't do it. The Flash, which had Supergirl and Batman and the Flash and everybody in it, they, that that movie has the kitchen sink in it. it has everything that you would think the audiences want to see. And some people go see it, and then they just kind of move on. There's just something new to watch. And I and I just feel like there's so much content now. I still want to make films. I still intend to make films. Um, but I don't know if I would make a film that was completely dependent on making its money back in traditional ways. I think I would need it to get financed ahead of time in some way to make sure that it didn't just lose money. Because I don't I don't know how when there are you know, 10,000 films being put out every year as opposed to like the 2,000 that we're putting put out every year in 2008. I don't know how you rise above it outside of just sheer dumb luck. Uh, would you accept money for a film without a distribution deal that goes along with it? Yes. Um, I, because most films, most films are financed without a distrib- distribution deal made. If you look at the way that even traditional films, you look at um, something like Air. Uh, they did not have a dis- distribution deal. They went out, they they independently financed, as far as I understand, they independently financed the film, then went to the American film market and sold it to, I guess, Amazon is who ended up buying. But you see these these little independent movies all the time that are that are being made for five, six million dollars with the idea of, we'll get a couple of boards, we'll sell it at the film market, and this company will pick it up, this or that. Um, so if somebody had a, a record of getting their things di- distributed, I know that you know, for instance, the company that I did the editing with, they they have a I've seen their movies show up on a horror channel called Shudder a lot. So it seems like they have a relationship with Shudder. So you'd want to do your due diligence and look into it, but ultimately it's, you know, anybody going into doing what I'm doing, expecting to make a ton of money is doing it for the wrong reason, likely you will fail. So do it for the art and do it because it's something that you want to do. And if you feel like you can make your money back, then that that's why you should be doing it. And that will, you know, ironically make you more likely to be discovered as if you're doing it just because the love, the love will show, show through sheer commerce. I don't know works anymore. Air had um, Matt Damon and uh, Ben Affleck going for it. Of course they couldn't afford Michael Jordan. 
<laughs> just some big stand-in guy. But the He's point always is that, just on the other side of the room. Exactly. But uh, <laughs> again, and uh, well, uh, Damon and Affleck also had that uh, a few years ago, that Project Greenlight, where they were trying to sure. put money into new filmmakers. And, and I don't think that really went anywhere. I don't think that produced any any films of merit. But still, they were trying to they were trying to do a little something to to ironically in the horror realm. Um, it did. The, there's a horror director named John Gulliger um, who came out of the last season that they did there. So the one place that it did sort of succeed was creating a B movie um, because it did make that guy's. I mean, it helped that that guy's dad was was a really well known actor in horror movies already. Um, but uh, but the, it that's the only time that it did is going into genre. Which is one of the reasons you do genre films. I would love. I was having a conversation with Daniel Ross, who is who's been my, you know, producing partner forever. I would be remiss if I didn't shout him out because he's now become sort of my, the link I have to Hollywood. That the man was the voice of Donald Duck, um, uh, and and this new Grimace campaign for for McDonald's. He was the voice of Grimace. He's been the the voice of of the main Gremlin. So he is a big giant voice actor uh, now. And uh, he and I were talking about what our next film was going to be. And he's like, I'd really like to do something kind of A24. I'd like to do something that really makes you think and really gets in there. And, 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 and I, and, and I, and I said to him, I said, I said that that's great. And we can certainly do that and try, but outside of genre movies, people are, aren't interested in watching your little indie drama that doesn't have Kate Blanchett in it. Like you're absolutely right. It, those movies had Matt Damon. If I made a movie that was as good with as good a script with as good actors, but I didn't have names that you already knew, I don't I don't know how or where that goes outside of like the, the Hallmark channel. Well, that's a great place to pause because we are not finished, and neither is Justin Tim Payne in covering the Justin Tim Payne landscape. We've we've had a great discussion about indie filmmaking and how it is changing. And we'll probably keep talking about that next time. But in part two, because there's going to be a part two, we're going to talk about music making too. And also Star Trek and Star Wars and talking about podcasting those things and the direction that those franchises are going in because he does those things too. And maybe we'll even talk to him, you know, about uh, human albumin and, you know, packed red blood cells and IV solution. So looking forward to that next. Donate blood. Donate, go out and donate blood. It's needed. Everyone needs a little. So thank you so much, nephew Justin. We will see you for part two next time on The Musical Inner Tube. Bye, everybody. And thank you for listening to The Musical Inner Tube. Our lovely little podcast is available everywhere good podcasts are found. Listen on your favorite platform, and if you like what you hear, please give us a good rating. And spread the word. Tell your friends about the inner two, and let them know they can subscribe to the podcast on our website, musicalinnertube.com. There you can listen to all of our podcasts, see pictures and biographies of our guests, and contact us. You can even click on the microphone button in the lower right corner to leave us a voicemail. And don't forget to leave your email address on our Talk to the Two page so we can stay in touch. And you can email us directly at musicalinnertube at gmail.com. And as always, thanks to virtual band Car Radio Dog for our theme music. <laughs>